This is Spiritual Civilization, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about the finished works of Christ. Good evening, people. Uh, good afternoon and good morning from whichever part of the world you're watching us from and from whichever time zone you're watching us from. This is One Desire. You're hosting today's episode of Spiritual Civilization. For those who've been here before, you know we are here to delve deep into the Word. And for those who've not been here, I'd say it's the same thing. We are here to delve deep into the Word. So we'll start out with a word of prayer, then uh, we'll go into the Word. Uh, Heavenly Father, you come before this day. We thank you for uh, life. We thank you for the opportunity, O oh Lord Father, to be in your presence, O oh Lord Father. As David said, better is a thousand days in your eye, uh, is one day in your court than a thousand days, O oh Lord Father. Mm. We are so grateful that once again we are able to come before your presence, O oh Lord Father. Mm. We thank you that uh, uh, for the word that you're going to deliver to us today, O oh Lord Father. Keep our hearts open, O oh Lord Father. And may the word that is going to be uh, spoken here may trans- uh, transform us. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so I'll introduce uh, the other panelist. I don't know whether to call him a host. Uh, Father in the Lord, uh, Bishop Gobanga J.O. Ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to welcome you people again. I know the the session is actually for one desire, but I also want to extend a, a warm welcome to each and every one of you that is tuning into these broadcasts and also to the panelists here. These are wonderful uh, men, very reputable, respectable in their own right, uh, fully fledged men, uh, married, and of course, uh, apart from one, the rest are uh, happy parents, and it's really a wonderful time for us to just uh, gather together. Um, today, I want us to talk about um, a very interesting uh, subject. I know this is something we may not be in a position of being able to probably fully exhaust. Actually, I'm even tempted to say that uh, today, uh, this might probably be more like uh, an introduction of sorts. Uh, the finished works of Christ. Um, I want to read a, a, a portion of uh, scripture here, actually two portions of scriptures. Uh, we'll first of all look at uh, Malachi chapter 1 uh, from verse 2 uh, to 3. And uh, we'll also look at Romans chapter 9 verse 10 to 13. Malachi 1, verse 2 to 3, and Romans 9, verse 10 to 13. And I begin. I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord. Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. So then I want to look at uh, Romans chapter 9, uh, verse 10 to 13, which is basically an emphasis of uh, that particular portion that we read in the Old Testament. Romans 9, 10, 13. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said of her, the older shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, of course, when we look at the Bible, uh, just at on the surface, uh, and I want to call it the human perspective. Uh, we, of course, can st- see that it is written that Esau sold his birthright to his brother, uh, Jacob, because of a plate of pottage. Others say a plate of lentils, a plate of porridge, and so on. 
I think people try to make it as uh, interesting as possible. Yeah. Now, um, you know, we must understand exactly the context in which this particular portion of scripture is written because it is first mentioned in the book of Malachi and we see the Apostle Paul elucidating more on it in the New uh, Testament whereby God hates Esau and loving Jacob. And, um, you know, to sell your birthright is evil. So you need to be hated for doing such if we are to look at it from a very uh, surface perspective. And uh, the truth of the matter is this. When you have the mind of Christ, mm -hmm. how are we to understand this particular scripture, especially when we consider the finished works of Christ? When you look at it with the mindset of Christ, you'll discover that the human perspective of this particular passage may not necessarily uh, sound uh, uh, sense because we know very well, beloved, God does not hate people. Mm. The nature of God is that he is not a God of hatred. God hates sin with perfect hatred, but God will not hate people. And uh, truth be told, if we are to consider it prophetically, Esau did, didn't sell his birthright to Jacob. Okay, okay. Mm. Yes, I know that is what is written in the Bible. The Bible says that he sold his birthright to Jacob, but I am persuaded to believe that Esau did not necessarily sell his birthright to Jacob. Esau sold his birthright to his own lust. And you see, the devil was already at work in him, just in the same way uh, Adam sold his dominion to Satan because of a bite of a fruit. All right. Now, wh wh why do we see Jacob in this particular account? I tend to believe that Jacob was basically an instrument of process in the life of Esau. You see? And the truth of the matter is, lust was actually involved. Okay? What is it that was being that they were lasting after food? Adam was lasting after the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Esau, on the other hand, was lasting after the food that Jacob had actually prepared. And Jacob is basically a system which God has set in place for Esau to reclaim his birthright again. I want you to flow with me because uh, there is somewhere I'm actually going with this. Wow. And maybe one would wonder by asking the question, is it really that God had so much hatred for Esau? I don't think so. Actually, God loved Esau with an unending love. And we know very well prophetically, and we see it in the New Testament, that uh, God had already proclaimed to Rebekah as concerning the destinies of these two children, even way before they were born. That's the truth of the matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that means that God did not love Jacob more than he loved Esau. Mm -hmm. The problem that God had with Esau was not the person of Esau. The problem that God had with Esau was the act that he actually did. He sold his birthright to last. Okay? And basically, um, God was basically using, and if we are to look at this story redemptively, God was basically devising some form of salvation to Esau through Jacob in order to restore his birthright again. That's the truth of the matter. Because you know, in the economy of Israel, one of the things that we notice is that the birthright is what attracts the first blessing of a father. Mm -hmm. mm. And um, the truth of the matter is, the one with the birthright to receive the blessing was supposed to have been Esau. 
but unfortunately Esau lost his birthright and was not qualified he was no longer qualified for actually the blessing and it was through the leading of his own mother Rebecca that Jacob took the place of Esau you see and as long as Jacob is concerned the blessing on his lips belongs to Esau so that means what Jacob did is that he decided to put on the likeness of Esau okay okay how did he put on the likeness of Esau he wore the garments of Esau and the hair of the goat he killed such that now deep in the heart of Isaac mm-hmm. Isaac knew that he blessed Esau mm-hmm. because Jacob presented himself as Esau now in the same way in the heart of the heaven of, of God the Father what do we see Jesus himself decided to put on the likeness of sinful man. Mm. He put on the likeness of sinful man so that now when the blessing is being pronounced upon the the, the fallen man that blessing comes through Christ. Mm-hmm. Mm. So that everything that pertains to salvation for the fallen human race is in Christ Jesus. It does not come to man directly. And, and 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 that is basically to say that uh, the inheritance of Christ mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. does not belong to Jesus. Jesus was in the likeness of sinful man. Mm-hmm. Okay? Mm-hmm. That blessing does not belong to that blessing belongs to the race of the fallen fallen human race. Hey. Jesus just like Jacob was basically a system that was to bring the fallen race of Adam into the economy of Christ. Hey. Okay? Hey. And this is basically reflecting on the finished works of Christ. All right? Because you see to the human mind we look at Jacob as a very treacherous person. That is how he's portrayed and a lot of people loathe him. We see him as a person who stole the birthright. of his bigger brother he saw the blessings of the bigger brother but in Christ mm. Jacob was working out the redemption of his brethren and in the same way we see when we we who are the, the, the members of the fallen race God himself came as our elder brother who is our elder brother Jesus Christ himself to redeem our birthright so that we may once again qualify as sons that's the truth of the matter such that now the moment jacob was blessed with the blessings of esau mm-hmm. what we see those blessings flowed into the into the life of esau of course we know very well as we read the story father esau comes to his father to ask for the blessing and the father tells him that you know what that blessing is with jacob and what does he pronounce he says the older will serve the younger and this yeah. is basically what Uh, apostle paul emphasizes in the new testament which means what for esau to access his blessings or his birthright if we put it that way mm. it has to be through jacob. jacob in the same way the adamic race for it to be able to access eternal life it is only through jesus christ jesus who's now basically uh, prefigured in the old testament as 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 jacob And you know beloved God always refers to those in the New Testament who believe in Jesus Christ as his sons. Jesus is the begotten son of God, but the rest of us we are all adopted sons. Okay? And bear in mind that God the Father comes in the form of Christ. Such that now Jesus assumes that position of the Father as his own choices system of redemption. And then when you look at the story in the New Testament after many many years we know very well that Esau had abundance and he was extremely blessed you know yeah. he was so much blessed even beyond the knowledge of his brother Jacob to the point whereby when you continue on with the story the time when Jacob uh, said word that he wanted to meet with his brother of course Jacob prepared gifts but we know very well that Esau rejected those gifts He rejected the gifts that Jacob came to present him why because already Esau had so much why because Esau embraced Jacob in his heart way even before Jacob was in search of him just the same way we know 
We all receive the blessings of eternal life when we embrace Jesus Christ deep in our hearts. Okay? So I want to open this particular conversation in light of what we've read. What is your understanding of the finished works of Christ based on that particular story of Esau and Jacob? Because, you know, many times people look at Jacob as a very, very wicked person. But the reality <laughs> of the matter is Jacob was not wicked. Mm. Jacob was an instrument. Of course, the process that in which he, the, the, the kind of role he played, it was a process. Okay. And most times, you know, we always look at Esau as one who is of the devil, as the one who lost it. Of course, he made lots of mistakes. But, you know, beloved, we must understand that these characters that you read about in the Bible, yes. it is not in our place to condemn them. Because if you were given the same, same circumstances, chances are we would have actually committed even much more worse things. We are not any better. And the more I mature in the faith, I have come to appreciate the role of each and every character that I read about in the Bible, starting from Adam, even every other man and woman that we read about in the New Testament. They were basically part and parcel of the system of the economy of the kingdom that was as to what God was actually doing behind the scenes. And that's why sometimes also, for you to be able to understand depths about what happened in the Old Testament, you need to read the New Testament. And that way you'll be able to see the redemptive work of Christ at work. So I open this floor for us to probably uh, discuss further. Hey, let me, let me be the first one to respond and highlight that I had never seen Jacob as the plan of redemption for what Esau was ultimately going to sell. So it's like God saw Esau's heart and his desire and the lust that were crouching at his door. And he realized that Esau was going to sell this birthright regardless of <laughs> who the buyer is. And in the same way that he provided Jacob as a willing buyer, to what uh, would he would eventually provide back to Esau through the embrace of uh, the journey of redemption and reconciliation is the same way that we, God saw that we were just going to sell our birthright. And before that, he, you know, the Bible says that he provided a sacrifice. The Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the world. So he knew that our last or the last that would have found expression through us would eventually lead to us selling our birthright and he needed to preserve it and he preserved it through christ who took on sinful flesh and bore the full judgment for our actions and also now gave us blessings and it gives a greater context to the finished works of christ it shows that the finished works of Christ is not some far off uh, theoretical plane of existence that is far removed from the realities of our day-to-day -day living. I am starting to see how there is this thread interweaved with our lives that shows that God is desperately trying to feed back into our lives that have been ravaged by sin. He's trying to feed back the blessing that was rightfully ours and it's 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 a love story between our maker and us that's a love story that i had not seen and it's quite exciting to read tell me now that you're talking i want you to comment on uh where is the place of um betrayal betrayal and treachery hey. okay in so far as these two brothers is concerned within that uh, broader perspective of the overarching purpose of god i don't know how do we look at betrayal because i'm just beginning to think that many times when whenever you go through betrayal you know it really hurts and as as well as also an individual who deploys the art or the scheme of treachery to be able to snatch something from you. And you know very well how 
how how you'd react and the immediate thing is that you know you don't want uh, god to to send fire from heaven to to destroy <laughs> this you. person you know <laughs> and uh, and then here we are we are, we are looking at jacob as someone who in as much as he, he his name actually depicts him as a supplanter but at the same time we are now seeing him as one who decides to redeem the birthright that his bigger brother is going to lose so now what have we to talk about um, people who betray mm-hmm. is it that uh, betrayal is something that uh, sometimes god may allow uh, essentially because of the fact that uh, we may fall short of being able to handle certain things that he, he entrusts to us would we say that uh, when the treachery that has actually been uh, committed against you to the extent where you lose certain things or certain opportunities would it also have something to do with the fact that god looking at our hearts realizing that maybe we don't have capacity so he allows someone to actually employ treachery to get you know to undercut you if i may put it that way especially at the place of work or a business opportunity or you are just betrayed and you know, i'm just trying to wonder someone betraying you and of course we know very well that in the new testament judas betrayed uh, christ so i don't know um hey. i want us to look at it from a human perspective at the same time i also want us to look at it broadly speaking where is the reconciliation where is the balance i think let me go next there are so many parallels i think this conversation is about to be deep <laughs> there are so many parallels i think now i'm seeing um how uh, how god uses time in his work because this story actually also reminds me of joseph and his brothers his brothers betrayed him they sold him they even, they had even desired to kill him it's it's just by uh the plan of uh Reuben that they didn't kill him and then later on the plan of Judah that they sold him so years later when they reconnect and come together Joseph says it is it was it was God who sent me here beforehand that's why he he now did not have anything against them he sent God sent him there beforehand to prepare uh, a place for them such that they would be ready for that famine i see the betrayal as in that case as uh, god preparing joseph for for the place the promise that he had given to him through the dreams but also at the same time i usually think about what if his brothers never betrayed him if the famine had happened perhaps he would have been people from Egypt and other places would have been the ones coming to Israel to 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 get bread because <laughs> perhaps he would have been the one to have the solution and would have prepared his own brothers and their families beforehand i don't know you know as in but would he have been ready for that would he have uh had the resources for that would he you know there are so many uh questions that you would ask if you were to go through that train of thought so even now coming back to this story of esau and uh, jacob jacob yes you may say that he he betrays his brother because jacob sees an opportunity to take the birthright uh and he sees how esau is does not even care he's nonchalant he's it's it's not of great importance to him and so he does he he, he takes that opportunity and goes for the birthright first of all with the uh with the food and then later on by the advice of the mother but god was using that behind the scenes that very same betrayal because we end up coming to see that uh 
the brothers later on Jacob coming and bowing to Esau this is a, the person who had received the birthright yet he comes humbling himself before Esau and and so i tend to think that the 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 essence and the the essence of what Esau lost he finally was able to get it through Jacob because you can see the trajectory of his life there are certain things the, the way the way that he was at that time when he now met with Jacob and the time that he was before when he was just a hunter when he was still a young man these are two very different men there's a processing that has happened and so we're seeing god using those shadows in the old testament to show us the reality of the new testament whereby when jesus says forgive them for they do not know what they are doing the it is it is the very same people who are crucifying jesus that jesus was actually giving his life for mm. so that they may be rescued so in that betrayal because john describes it best he came to his own but his own did not recognize him but his own rejected him so those who whom he came to rescue are the ones who crucified him and in doing that they unleashed the power of salvation grace mercy the this uh wonderful salvation that we enjoy now is because of that betrayal mm. god was using god has always been using evil hearted people to still fulfill his will not that we are meant to be evil as paul would put it not that we may continue in sin so that grace may abound but as we but as we experience it in our in our walk from other people from our enemies from people who will persecute us for the sake of the gospel because some people are persecuted for other things <laughs> but when you're persecuted for the sake of the gospel that is where there is great joy that is when we are see that is when we will see that this is actually all things working together for good when we are able to see the bigger picture because mm. most of the time we are just seeing what is at present and happening to us now but the bigger picture shows us that even when we suffer then therein there is glory yeah that's All what right. i think let me hear from the other two gentlemen um, if i may i think the the points you raised are really valid rob um i think if you if you really think about it, there are two aspects of betrayal so someone will betray you out of the fact that they are fallen they have the adamic nature in them but at the same time behind that betrayal God himself has allowed it to happen mm-hmm. because either there's a certain principle that he wants to teach or reveal not only to the person being betrayed but even the people who are witnessing that betrayal or there is a certain element of uh, familiarity that may creep in in the individual either with God or even with the purpose of God that mm-hmm. is within their lives and when you when you really think about it like even if you look at all of the betrayals that have occurred in the bible if you look at the the story of judas if you look at the story of um, the story of esau and jacob you'll realize that um in one way or the other the redemptive plan of god has consistently been in mind throughout the course of scripture and um when you really think about it, when i think about the finished work of christ because i know bishop had asked what do we really think about the finished work of christ um you know we are we're actually nearing easter you know easter is tomorrow and um the finished work of Christ to me is a reality that has to be there on a daily basis it means that for this particular day that i have gone through god's purpose has been fulfilled for it that from the time i woke up to the very time that i went to bed 
that the purpose of God has been accomplished for that particular day. But the challenge with us as, as believers, let me say religious believers, we usually look at it as uh, we wait until Easter to celebrate Christ. And then after Easter, we go back into default setting until Christmas or until any other pagan holiday. And then we forget the fact that the finished work of Christ is something that you need to live out on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not just a one-time affair. Yeah. Um, in regards to betrayal, I think uh, one of the things that, you know, as you are speaking that stood out for me is that uh, betrayal is sometimes a roundabout way of God saying, um, you are not ready for this, or I have something better in mind for you. Mm. Uh -huh. So, um, with that in mind, it has helped me look at a lot of things. I'm like, uh, the, uh, I should not be angry at people for betraying me. Mm. Yes, it hurts. Um, yeah, yes, it's annoying. Um, but when you look at things from God's perspective, that he has already seen the end of something and he has said it is good, uh, we, should, uh, we should not focus so much on the betrayal, but even focus on the fact that but focus on the fact that um, God has seen beyond the betrayal. Uh, Jake, um, for Jacob, when he betrayed himself and he ran away, when he was coming back, he was like, he remembered several <laughs> years ago. <laughs> I betrayed my brother and it's still fresh in my heart. Mm. <laughs> um, not knowing that uh, he saw had already gotten over it um when uh, joseph's brothers went and they realized this is joseph they were like wow we are being we are being we are now going to be skinned for betraying joseph knowing that not knowing that joseph has already gone beyond mm -hmm. and he has prepared for them even greater more than food mm -hmm. he's even given them the best land in egypt to stay in yeah mm -hmm. um for for Jacob, yeah, not knowing that it so ha has already gone beyond the betrayal, and he doesn't want to, he doesn't want to plunder him yeah. or pay for his uh, wealth. He just wants to to receive him. And um, sometimes we have to, when you are able to, because what at the end of the day, when you see the Esau receives Joseph, you realize for him. It's not about even receiving his birthright, it's receiving a relationship back. Yeah. yeah. Um, sometimes when we go through circumstances in life and uh, when our um, hearts are ready for something, even for that thing that we lost in the betrayal, God brings it back because for, for, for God, uh, even when, quote unquote, as we be, uh, through Adam we betrayed God, God wanted to redeem us. God has already sp uh, spoken about redeeming a relationship. When I look at now betrayal from now this whole new perspective, I'm, I'm seeing in one way or another, God is redeeming something in that betrayal. God is uh, keeping something for us that is good, even in the circumstances that we cannot see. So yeah, this is a, has been a very interesting um, uh, eye opener. Wow, this is quite uh, amazing. So you see, um, ladies and gentlemen, we must understand that God's purpose will always be the primary factor yeah. in our undertakings, as well as also even in how we engage with fellow brethren. Mm. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we come across people, especially looking at them, on a surf at, a, a, at the surface, we easily get carried away to dismiss them, not knowing that people that God walks into our lives, they have a prophetic role to play in shaping us uh, in a way and in a manner such that we become far much better than we once were. Because you see, God has plans. He has his purpose. He has got certain things that he'd like us to receive. But the unfortunate thing is that most times we are not even ready, especially when we have been bestowed with a coveted position or designation, mm. the same way as Esau, you know, mm. the same way as even Joseph. Remember Joseph, 
much as the Bible does not talk much about this, Joseph was a braggart. Mm -hmm. He was a favorite of his dad. He was loved so much. And as if that is, that is not enough, he had two dreams about his, his future. And he started talking about it. You see? And little did he know that he was basically playing into the hands of the, of, of the enemy. And the enemy here is not his brothers. That's also something we must also yeah. understand. Mm. The enemy was the en was was Satan. Satan had actually purposed to destroy Joseph, yeah. but God, working behind the scenes, God who knows the end from the beginning, the, God decided to come up with a a strategy, and the strategy was that this boy was going to be sold as a slave yeah. to a foreign land whereby he went through all kinds of things. And when you look at Joseph, Joseph turns out to be a far much better person. Mm. He is not full of revenge. In fact, the very first time when he recognizes his brothers and they don't have any idea of him, he wanted to know whether these guys had changed. Mm. I think you actually remember the time when yeah. he detained one of the brothers. That must have been, I think, Benjamin. Yeah. And as the story goes, what Joseph wanted was relationship. Because, you know, having been separated from his family for all those years, it must have really uh, made him feel that sense of loss. And seeing his brethren was something that was far much more important than even what they did to him. And that's why he was able to tell his, bro his, his brothers that, you know what, you guys you had evil intentions. But when I look at it, it was actually God who was at work. Mm -hmm. And remembering the, the prophecy that... Uh, came to Abraham concerning his future descendants. Yeah. You know, that uh, these guys will become slaves in Egypt. And this was something that Joseph actually had actually known. And he knew that a time would come whereby uh, his brethren, or rather the descendants, would actually go back to the promised land. Yeah. And when you look at Esau, Esau, much as he was offended, he still longed for his brother. The mm. question I wanted to ask is, even when people betray us, to what extent have we been able to long for that relationship aspect? Can you think of a person that you trusted so much? It could be a spouse, it could be a sibling, it could even be even a cousin, a, a very close friend, you know? I'm just imagining, and I've had these cases before, um, two gentlemen, or uh, two gentlemen who are friends, then one of them is dating a very, very pretty girl. And um, then the other one decides to go behind the scenes, capitalizing maybe on a certain weakness or shortcoming of his body. And the girl and, 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 and the friend's girlfriend confides in this guy. This guy decides, you know what, to take advantage, to bad mouth his own closest friend. And in the process, he decides to take over this girl as a relationship and even gets married. And you find that the two men become enemies forever. You know? So now, I don't know. What have you to say to that? Because, you know, from a human standpoint, um, the person who's actually been betrayed is justified. Yeah. I mean, you're my best friend. You know everything about myself. You know that even I do not know how to become a good boyfriend to my girlfriend. He's come to you and uh, you've decided to expose her to aspects about me. And in the, in the long run, you took over the relationship. Hey. And I'm left there hanging. Hey. I have seen this in church. Like I know of a lady in a church that I used to be. Till today, and it's been years, she's not married. Yet many years ago, her own closest friend, whom she introduced to her boyfriend, decided to go behind the scenes and turn the tables. And the man himself, who is a man of means with a stable career, was drawn to this lady's closest friend. Mm -hmm. And they got married and they have children. Actually, she's not even the only lady. There's even another one who also did that. You know, she took over another woman's uh, fiancé. The fiancé is a pastor. And uh, she's living. And, uh, with that, and, and now this other lady ended up marrying another man of God. And unfortunately, 
the relation between this lady and, 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 and the man of God is not good. And as it is, they have separated. Actually, this is the second time that they have separated. And uh, her former fiancé later on had to apologize to her for what happened, but unfortunately, it's too late. So, I want you guys to tell me, what do you think about that? It is hard. Very, very hard. Mm. It is it is hard. And not just surface level hard, it is... Because what, what we are saying here is that we need to live in such a way, a, a path of clarity that allows us to always see God's sovereignty at work. Mm-hmm. Even when our blood boils, you know, I come from a place where our family is a hot blooded family. <laughs> you know, we, we know of warm blooded and cold blooded as we are hot blooded. We have a direct super highway from our minds to our mouth. Mm. We, 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 we are hearing things the same time you are hearing. <laughs> so for us to set that aside, and all the emotions and passions that come from betrayal and to see it from God's sovereign working in play. Whew, that one is... Now, God is easy. God is quite able. God has brought me from very far. And I know that he can actually work this thing in me. But way, this one, I cannot achieve it as Kofu. I cannot achieve it by my own strength. Way. Wait. Can you imagine? Look, look now. Let, let, let me even take it further. <laughs> you and Lily, you are employed in a, in the same company. You're in the same department, and uh, Lily is up for promotion. Yeah. You, you are not. But there are certain things you know about Lily that your supervisor does not know. So you go and miss report, and uh, eventually Lily misses out on the promotion he was expecting, but you get the promotion. Okay. Yeah. Then Lily gets to discover this. And you and and, and and now what happens is Lily has to answer to you. Yeah. His own best friend. <laughs> you know, in the same same department. Bearing in mind that you've you've been friends since Sunday school. Where? So how do you handle that? <laughs> that one is hard without uh, like of course that would be that is a very hard situation. First it's a humbling situation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, humility is taught when you when you know something is your right but you can't access it. No, it's mm-hmm. thinking about it the other day. It's best taught when you know you are right mm-hmm. but you can't act on the fact that you are right. Mm-hmm. Uh so you know for me in such like i'd say theoretically in such a situation i'd like to think of it uh, i'd like to focus more on uh, what christ has done for me for example uh, the many times i know i have let god down or i have betrayed god mm. <laughs> even in salvation that's the those are the kind of uh, thoughts at least i try to keep in I haven't said in, of course, this is a hypothetical situation, but you know, situations that have been similar in my life, and I'm finding it so hard to uh, forgive somebody. And uh, you know, the Holy Spirit reminds me, uh, but I forgave you when you were doing this and this. Or oh, before you did this, I, I forgave you. And uh, you, are, you are built in my image. So um, why, why, why can't you replicate the same? And at that point, I think, uh, you know, it's more die, dying to the flesh. You have to die to your own rights and privileges. I have a right to be angry at this person. Yeah. I have a right to express those emotions of uh, heart, pain, disgust, and all that. Uh, within the realms of mankind, I am very entitled to do so. But because... Uh, I am now seated with Christ. I'm seated in Christ. I have to have the mind of Christ. I think one of the hardest things about having the mind of Christ is 
you know, having that clarity to forgive and to let go of people. I think it's, uh, for me, it's, it's, it's useless to be able to speak in tongues and all these things if I cannot mm-hmm. quite let go of a grudge. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I realized a few weeks ago I was reading, reading the Bible and you know, uh, you know that passage of scripture where it says, uh, no, men will come to, say, to me and say, I did, I hate people in your name, cast out devils, I did all that. And God will say, go away from me, you did not know me. It's because you did not know the lo- me in uh, God's love in me. I was not able to uh, uh, resonate with that. Mm-hmm. And because God is love and I'm not able to resonate with that, I'm even unable to uh, love other people even in those hurtful circumstances. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying you shouldn't feel pain, of course you will. It's part of the human process. But eventually, even as we... Uh, swim or wallow in that pain and miasma of confusion, I think also we should also have the uh, humility of heart to tell God, hey, help me forgive this person. I think that's what I usually do. Sometimes if I feel somebody has offended me, I'm like, God, help me forgive this person because in my heart, I do not want to forgive this person because I, I, I want to be like Christ. If, uh, if I'm to achieve the list of all things, it should be that I should love other people now you know you focused so much on the the victim yes in this case isau yes in this case joseph yes let's look at jacob the supplanter the one who was used as an instrument to snatch the birthright <laughs> and the blessing of the firstborn mm. you know hey. Mm-hmm. Let's look at um, the case of, um, of 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 who of Judas. Mm-hmm. Judas betrayed Jesus. Okay. Let's also look at the case of uh, the brethren of uh, Joseph. Mm-hmm. Look at what they did to him. You know. Um, what is your perspective about the betrayer? Okay. Because when I look at Jacob. Jacob took away the birthright and took away the blessing of the firstborn. And you see, one thing we know is that um, the firstborn's blessing is attached to birthright. Yeah. So when uh, Esau decided to sell his birthright to his own lusts, automatically that meant that he was displaced and he, and he fell short of qualifying for the firstborn's blessing. And that's why now uh, Rebecca's, uh, Rebecca, who happens to be the mom, decided now to use Jacob mm. to receive the blessing that was meant for Esau. So when now we look at Jacob, Jacob uh, finds himself in a dilemma. He's already taken the blessing. And as if that is not enough, there's nothing Isaac can do. You know, Isaac cannot curse his son mm. because that blessing is not just pronouncements of words. You're, you're conferring right and authority. And yeah. you know, when God gives you something, when he confers upon you such a blessing, he can never take it back, no matter what. So Jacob takes off. And amazingly, and I think, and, 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 I, and I hope uh, even viewers you'll be able to see where I'm headed with this particular thing. Jacob has taken the blessing. Yeah. He has the birthright mm-hmm. yeah. that belongs to Esau. He goes to a place and then he falls asleep and he has a vision. Mm. He has a vision of heaven. He sees angels descending. He has an encounter with God. Mm. A supplanter. Mm. A what? A supplanter. Goes to his um, uh, to his uncle Laban, the brother to Rebecca. Works for him, of course. At the same, while he's working for this guy, that blessing that he received from his dad mm-hmm. began to work wonders in the flock of Laban to the point where his uncle also now decided to um, to outsmart him. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. The uncle decides to 
to, to, to swap the daughters. Instead of him receiving Rachel, whom he loved, he was given Leah, the firstborn. Okay? And then now he had to work for extra, uh, an, an, an extra number of years to now get the one that he wanted. And then, of course, you know the story of the flock. Yeah. Uh, I, I, sometimes I'm tempted to refer to Jacob as, as a wizard because... <laughs> did you see how those animals... How, how, this, how, how they started growing? Yeah. yeah. The flock multiplied. But you know, mm. Jacob played something. Yeah. I'm yet to understand that and I'm trusting God for, for the spirit of revelation to give me insight as to how he managed to ensure that his flock became more and they were doing pretty well as opposed to that of his uncle. Yeah. So I want us to look at um, the betrayer, the supplanter, insofar as the purpose of God is concerned in his life. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the, uh, you know, the victim, who in this case is Esau. What have you to say to that? Mm. And remember, God is still appearing to him. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> God, has, God, God, God has been appearing to the supplanter. So what have you to say to that? What are you able to capture out of that? Let me say something about my personal experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there's one time uh, um, I was in fellowship with a uh, school here, and a uh, certain very senior person called me, told me come and see me. And he said, uh, okay, this, uh, this has happened. But he said something that stood, st uh, was very key in my mind. And he told me, the plan of the devil is to separate the relationship you have from your father and the Lord. Yeah. And that thing, you know, it completely changed my mind about, you know, everything. Uh, disagreements, everything was like, uh, for the way God and the devil sees things, the same things in terms of the greatest resource somebody has is a relationship. Mm. It's not the things you think you get out of the blessing. It is the way the blessing is able to affect the relationship and change mm -hmm. people's relationship. Yeah. So for me, from that day, even when, like, if I, yeah, if I disagree with somebody, I'm like, the issues and the disagreement, the issues, after that, do I still want the relationship with this person? Mm -hmm. And for me, that's how I look at it from the perspective of the betrayer. Does, at the end of the day, um, what is God redeeming? Is God redeeming? Uh, <laughs> is God redeeming the the blessing, or is He redeeming the relationship? When you look at, when I started looking at it that way, you start realizing. Um, in fact, God, you know, He set aside sin for the sake of relationship, and He set aside sin through the cross for the sake of relationship. So as somebody who's uh, now in that space of thinking as a betrayer, um, I think what can redeem a betrayer or what should go, uh, can redeem the mind of, of a betrayer is um, what is my perspective of, of a relationship? How important is this relationship with this person to me? I think that is the thing that can redeem the betrayer. Otherwise, uh, for me, beyond that, uh, God will not take away <laughs> this other gift because now, you know, like the way we pray, the chairman is so God cast him and he stop, his, <laughs> stop his businesses, mm -hmm. you know, he, he bring darkness into his life and all that, and you wonder why God is not bringing darkness. <laughs> For God, those are immaterial to the fact that a relationship has been destroyed here. So for me, it's I think that aspect of relationship is, to God is very key more than the aspect of uh, punishing somebody's uh, blessings because you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are still talking. You know, Bishop, I've been a betrayer. <laughs> <laughs> Let me highlight I that. Uh, I have been a betrayer. There are some situations where I was 
I was in charge or rather I was in control of majority of the betrayal. But there are other situations where it seemed like despite anything I did, it just fueled the betrayal. And when I look at the perspective of the betrayer, the betrayer is also subject to the sovereignty of God. Uh -huh. mm. The betrayer does not exist in this context of ultimate power where, you know, as the movies try and tell us, someone is scheming and, <laughs> and uh, playing the right cards. He's a master chess player. He operates within the boundaries of God. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you see, there are times God can, can accelerate your betrayal as I suspect he did with Jacob and Isam. Because when you look at, now when you look at that scenario as it played out, there are certain things that had to be orchestrated by an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent being mm -hmm. for that context of betrayal to bear fruit. Mm -hmm. Equally so, when you look at the context of Christ and Judas, there are certain things that had to be orchestrated by an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent being for that betrayal to come to pass. Mm. Just like also the context of Joseph. Mm. Joseph's context had so many moving parts mm. and it required some sovereign hand at work mm. Mm. to cause that betrayal to come to fruition. Mm. And I think speaking from the perspective of the betrayer, the betrayer's betrayal is, is what kills the flesh in the betrayer when he comes to the end of himself. Because mm, after mm. Jacob betrayed Esau, you know, he was, he was excited and everything, but he started testing the difficulty of the lost relationship. Mm -hmm. And that difficulty of that lost relationship caused him when he appeared before Pharaoh, when Pharaoh tasked him, okay, how has your life been? My life has been short with a difficult, difficult years. <laughs> yeah. Despite his betrayal, despite all the success that led to his betrayal, that betrayal caused that betrayer to be so humble. And the same thing, because you know, immediately after betrayal, Judas was overrun mm. by guilt. Mm. Now, by his choice, he opted to hang himself, but that is usually a ripe opportunity for mm. conviction, mm -hmm. for you to understand that, wow, I am actually at fault. I take responsibility for this mess I have created and I trust an omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient being to guide me out of this mess. So I mm. think, Bishop, that the betrayer is humbled upon the success of his betrayal. Mm -hmm. You know, you just reminded me of something. Peter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Peter betrayed Christ. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now he didn't know it was going to happen. Actually, Jesus <laughs> foretold. He told him when the cock, before the cock, well, what was it? Before the before cock cries three I times, yes. you will deny me. Yes. Jesus told him. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you know, several times Jesus kept on speaking to Peter in a very figurative way with regards to his faith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He told him, you know, you know yes. what, me, I've prayed for you. Yes, yes. I know what the enemy is doing, but I've already, I've already sorted out. In other words, whatsoever you do, whatsoever you say, will never change the purpose of God concerning your life, Peter. Yeah, yeah. You see? Yeah. <laughs> Peter was confident in himself. Yes, yes. The same way betrayers are usually confident in Thank themselves. You. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Until such a time when they come to the end of themselves. And, it's, and, 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 and you people, you're, you're mentioning something very important. Sometimes even whatsoever you, whatsoever a betrayer take, uh, snatches away from you, it's not really the issue. What the betrayer loses fundamentally is the relationship. Yeah. You see? Yeah. It, it has nothing to do with materialism. It yeah. has nothing to do with the promotion. It's the relationship. The same way the victim of betrayal also feels that loss of the relationship. Yes. Okay. Yes, you might feel like you are displaced, yeah. but when you look at it in the grand schemes of things, the thing which is at stake here is relationship. You're right. You're right. And the question that people must ask themselves is whether are we going to focus on the material things that we are fighting over? Are we going to fight over positions or designations 
Or is there something else that we need which God values most? And that is relationship. And sometimes, you know, God will allow betrayal to come into our lives for us to be able to understand the value of okay. relationship. Wow. Because relationship surpasses herds of cattle. Mm. And I think Jacob learned that the hard way. Yeah. Relationship surpasses positions, mm. you know? And sometimes, you know, a betrayer will have to suffer many things the same way Jacob went yeah. through many things. Yes. Wow. Because he had taken life for granted. Yes, it's true. You see? Wow. In fact, yes. what I would even say is this. Betrayers tend to suffer more than even those who've been betrayed. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Let's, uh, let's have this conversation. We are still talking. There's so much that we can uh, get out of this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are, we are, we are having a, conver a conversation within the context of the finished works of Christ. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think... I think the thing that keeps ringing in my head is the from that question that you asked about the betrayer, what is the perspective of the betrayer? And I realized the end result of the betrayer is either reconciliation or death. And it's 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 in in our context it would be the death of a relationship. Mm -hmm. Like in, in terms and when I when when I say the death of a relationship, you have to understand that something about that person dies with that mm. relationship. Mm. All the benefits, all the uh, the things that were to come out of that relationship, all the um, connection, all the benefits that were to come from that relationship die at that very moment or there is the potential for reconciliation because um i look at someone like cain cain god did not speak to abel but he spoke to cain <laughs> he spoke to the one whom he had not accepted whose sacrifice he had not accepted in, we live in a time when we, we desire to hear the voice of God. <laughs> we desire to hear the voice of God. And it is in the place of betrayal that we, we may be able to hear him even more clearly. Because even Jacob, uh, even jo Joseph, Joseph when uh, he was testing his brothers, it was the same Judah who sold Joseph that came and said, Take me instead of Benjamin because my father will not live if we do not go back with Benjamin. Therefore, take me in his place. He was basically saying what Christ was saying mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. that I will come in the place of these people and I will die and redeem them. I will be the sacrificial lamb, mm. you know. Uh, the same thing that Jacob was doing with Esau. He, was, he came and bowed seven times. <laughs> and sending flock and th that kind of humil humility, he was brought to a realization of the real, real need for relationship and what it took for him to reconcile. The, the understanding of what it took for him to reconcile was also another kind of death. It was a, a dying to self so that the relationship may be reconciled. So I'm seeing the result of the betrayer is either death to self, which reconciles relationships, or death of a relationship which destroys purpose such like for example now Judas yes. who in the moment that he realized what he had done and guilt came upon him that was an opportune moment for him to repent that was an opportune moment for him to to come and 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 see but he, I think in that moment, uh, 
not just to fulfill prophecy but also uh, in his mind he could not see another way out he could only see death and that's what was his result and so i'm seeing and, and the death of judas was also the death of his purpose mm. and so i am seeing that the betrayer has two options the minute they betray either to come to a re- realization of who they are by dying to self and the beauty and the uh, essence of relationship of what we are created for or to allow the death of the relationship for the sake of things that will not really last um which that, says that yeah. means you see the betrayer has a responsibility to reach out to the betrayed yes yes the betrayer has to do that reach out to the betrayed because you know sometimes people who betray others they always feel entitled and they say you know what well it's too late time is past so yeah. on and so forth yeah. even when it is crystal clear that the betrayer is not doing well in life. Yes, yes. You yes, see, yes. and most betrayers do not understand the value of relationship. Yes. Because you know, you can take away something from me yes. or take away an opportunity which I may never get. But the question is, what about the relationship? You see relationship is something that we can recover. The only thing is that we can't relate with each other the same way it used yes. to be. What happens is that God in his sovereignty he enables and he come he orchestrates a process whereby the betrayer and the betrayed are able to relate with each other within the broader uh, perspective of the purpose of god yeah. and that is something which is very fundamental mm. because also at the same time whoever that has been betrayed mm. if he or she is the kind of an individual who's open to god it will also be an opportunity to be able to understand the reason as to why god allowed certain things to happen because most of those who are betrayed always play the victim yes yeah, yeah. you see i've also been there where i feel i've been betrayed mm. i play the victim but then again i ask myself what if i never underwent betrayal what if i never got myself into this situation would i have done better yeah and chances are not I've always looked at it in terms of um and especially you know in 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 ministry I've always seen it as also God's way of making me understand that there are certain things about his sovereignty yeah. there are certain things about his grace and Come his on. purpose that I've taken for granted yeah. you see yeah. like um you know in instances whereby I've dealt with a minister a fellow minister of the gospel whom I had high expectations of him or her and then the next thing the person takes advantage of a certain aspect of myself it could probably be either a weakness it could be a personal challenge and this person uses it to his or has a advantage and uh, the next thing that happens is that i feel like i have lost a uh, face uh, within the clergy i've lost you know by one or two things but then when i look at it again i realize by the way even what this person did was also an opportunity for me to do a self audit in so far as my heart post is concerned in so far as even things that maybe i had not really focused on and um the approach that i've always taken is you know what um i do not see the need of holding on to bitterness or unforgiveness uh, to either to to a fellow minister of the gospel the best i can just do is to surrender everything to god and to wish that this individual lives a better life and that through that experience of betrayal the person will 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 will, will turn out to be far much better and this is to say beloved we have no business avoiding each other yeah because when we avoid each other then it means the whole work of redemption is not actualized the finished works of christ which were already executed in the womb of eternity 
according to divine wisdom, that whole uh, uh, manifestation is not effected in us. Mm -hmm. It can only be effected when we understand what the power of the cross ah. and why Jesus mm -hmm. Christ is referred to as the Lamb of God yeah. who was slain from the foundations of the earth. Mm -hmm. And for that reality to dawn on you, both the betrayer and the victim must come to the end of themselves and say, you know what? I let go. Uh. Because the victim or the betrayed can opt to reject and shun the betrayer out of pride. Yeah. Yet God would still want an aspect of his purpose to be actualized in the heart of the betrayed through the same same betrayer. Yeah. The same way it happened to Jacob yeah. and Esau. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, I think for me, um, the way I see the, the role of the betrayer or the impact consequences, so to speak, that the betrayer goes through is basically um, a withdrawal of Calvary. Hmm. The, the reason I say so is if you look at even um, the story of Adam in the garden, Adam to some extent betrayed God because sin is actually a type of betrayal. Um, and by virtue of him doing that, the covering that he had was withdrawn. And that's the reason as to why he discovered he was naked. Um, the story of Moses, Moses had two options. He could either kill the Egyptian and basically continued developing a relationship with the Hebrews, or he would have killed the Hebrew and basically gone on in relationship with the Egyptians. But he chose to actually go ahead and kill the Egyptian. And then he went to the wilderness. The reason he went to the wilderness is because he realized the covering that he had with the Egyptians was withdrawn. So he had to basically start a new journey of knowing himself, discovering who he is, discovering what exactly God had in store for him. So I, I feel like to a great extent, even when you betray someone, the covering is withdrawn. The only question is, what is the nature of that covering? And how long does it take the individual to now identify and realize, wow, this is actually what I've lost um, within the covering that is there in a relationship? So it, it actually makes sense why relationship is very powerful. It's because every relationship has a covering. The question is just, what is the nature of the covering? And what is it that that particular relationship is supposed to supply to the individuals that are in it? You've talked about something to do with covering. Maybe we can probably zero in on that. Every relationship has a covering. Mm -hmm. When you miss out on relationship or when you betray somebody and uh, there's a fallout, the covering is withdrawn to the panelists. What exactly is this thing called to do with covering? Because, you know, we only hear of covering in the context of you are in a particular church and you are under a certain bishop or senior pastor is your covering. But maybe we must now revisit this thing of covering in the context of what we are sharing. What is covering? I understand cover from body technology. Uh, it is a set of benefits that you receive um, by consequence of relationship uh, with the person that worked hard to receive them. Um, you can think of, you see, the eye sees, mm. but it ensures that the body does not slam itself <laughs> <laughs> against walls and barriers. Uh, and it works in conjunction with the motoring system mm. within the, the body. Cover is is not, and this is it's a point of deliverance, uh, as Kofu in thought. Cover is not something you only receive from uh, from the people who you want to mine or extract uh, benefit from. Cover is something that you receive horizontally, laterally, and even for those who are be below you. Yeah. There are certain things that you cannot do because of your stature in life and you require someone to cover you and do them on your behalf. Uh, because if you are found to be doing such things, they would lead other people to be stumbled and such like things. So cover is not something that is only, it's, it's not only a benefit you receive from them that are above you. You receive from everyone who God has walked into your life. Every individual that God has walked into your life has the capacity to cover you and to provide you for a benefit by consequence of that uh, relationship. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. Covering is a hedge. It's a hedge. It's a hedge that insulates you from 
deficiency. It is a hedge that uh, guarantees you uh, a sense of security within that con uh, construct, uh, whereby there is uh, what we refer to as an exchange program. You're not just one who is mining, but others are also mining from you. Come on. And so on. let's stop. I think also covering is protection. It's um, it's also it's protection, but also it's being given an arena or an avenue or an environment, an atmosphere to be able to function properly, um, to be capacitated to function properly. If you look at even like the covering that a husband would give to a wife, um, the wife is able to express herself in the best way because of the covering of the husband. Without, without that covering, um, there's, she's not protected and she's incapacitated in so many areas. Um, so I see it also as a network. Um, when you're in relationship, you're connected to the network that enables you to function not only with your own giftings, but also with the giftings of others. Because uh, Richard has something that I don't have and I have something that he doesn't have. And because we have connected, uh, there's, the, there's that um, expression that I'm able to have or we are able to have by virtue of being in each other's lives rather than being separate. Um, so yeah. covering is basically an atmosphere, an atmosphere of uh, jurisdiction, mm -hmm. an atmosphere of uh, divine awareness mm -hmm. uh, that uh, is very fundamental in a relationship. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're within a particular atmosphere of awareness, what that means is that you have, you have access yeah. to be yourself, to express yourself, knowing very well that as you do so, you are not only impacting the life or the lives of those in, with whom you are in a relationship with, but at the same time, uh, they too are also experiencing the same. It's basically an exchange program. You know, covering is an atmosphere, an atmosphere, um, a jurisdiction, an awareness, uh, a sphere an ambience, social ambience, if, if I may put it that way, uh, for relationship to thrive. And betrayal, what it does, it destroys that, that atmosphere. Uh, betrayal, what it does is that it deprives people of the privilege to be able to engage and commune with each other, which is very, very fundamental. And you see, that's why uh, the finished works of Christ, basically, takes into consideration the need for men and uh, uh, members of the human race being able to be restituted back to that oneness with God. Oneness that gives them the opportunity to find expression and being able to bring forth the potential that they have within themselves. Meaning, there are certain things that, yes, they are resident in us, but they cannot be expressed except that we are walked into a particular jurisdiction, mm. a context, an awareness, an atmosphere mm. where, you know, uh, the grace of God is available for us to stir up our giftings, our talents, and our abilities. You see, when Jacob did what he did, what happened is that he lost that covering that existed between him and his brother, yeah. despite the fact that he was hearing God. Mm -hmm. That tells you this, it is possible for you to hear God, yes, yeah. even as a betrayer, but the fact that you've betrayed somebody, you are at a loss until you come to the end of yourself and go back yes. to being restored to your uh, brethren. So I don't know whether there's anything else that uh, anybody would like to say, even as we draw ourselves to a close of this session. 
Hey, Asante. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, there's there's one thing I wanted to to mention when when you were when we were talking about the the victim and there was a question that you had asked um like if for like the example you used about uh, Richie betraying Lily in the workplace I I think I'm still at the impact of that just trying to see um like how would i respond because this is a person you you are reporting to now you will be seeing every day you can't run away from that situation you can't avoid this person so so because sometimes we avoid so that we quote unquote heal um from the betrayal <laughs> <laughs> so you can't run away from this person you are seeing this person every day i'm i'm trying to see even how I would resist bad mouthing this person you know and things like that so it's it's a very it's a very interesting angle that you brought in when you now said relationship um is is actually in essence what is being attacked rather than the possessions or the position or um it, the thing that actually caused the betrayal to happen um and so it helps to see that perspective and also to realize that the in the perspective of the betrayer there is that which they are also being uh exposed to even though you as the victim may not be able to see it because sometimes we want the, mm-hmm. i think the victim wants to see justice I want to see justice must come and it must come now. But according to scripture what one thing we learn is do not try to get even. But allow the Lord to to do his work. Do not try to get even but allow the Lord to do his work. Um I believe it's in Romans 13 uh towards the end. So It's important for us to really recognize that God is actually trying to God not not God is trying God is reconciling all things under Christ. And that's what is happening in our lives to the end of the age. Reconci- reconciliation is between God and man and also between man and man. and that's why we love our enemies we pray for those who persecute us we we love our neighbors we love becomes the core thing that actually fulfills the will and the purpose of god so it's not easy but it is that is what we have been called into it's a beautiful thing it's a wonderful thing and I can't I can't wait to begin to put this in practice because I feel like I'm being delivered from my own self my that self that would want justice would want ah uh-huh. <laughs> god where were you yeah. <laughs> where what what have you done for me <laughs> how how did you allow this to happen that aspect is dying and I am grateful for that you know the justice of god cannot be limited to an event or an occurrence yeah if god were to uh, register his justice based on a particular situation then he would actually be deemed as an unjust god yeah it's true the justice of god works on the strength of the finished works mm. of christ even when god passes judgment in the bible when you look at the judgment of god it is redemptive mm. it is centered on the works of christ mm. that's why when you when you do not have the, the revelation of the workings of god through the men of old in the old testament you might end up mis- mis- misrepresenting god you know when god commands a king to destroy a particular nation and you begin to feel you know what everybody that is against my progress 
must be destroyed <laughs> by fire and so on. That is not how God operates in the New Testament. <laughs> Yeah. Just the same way, when you look at the prophets of the of the Old Testament, these were people who spoke through uh, dark shadows. Let me put it that way. Yeah, they had glimpses of light, but they did not have the fullness of light. Mm. They spoke in part. Yeah, but everything that they said, as well as what we read in the law, points to Christ. Yes. Mm-hmm. That is why, in as much as in the Bible we know that it was it is it was said of all that um, whoever that uh, commits adultery should be stoned to get to death. But you see now, what Jesus says, he raises the bar higher to say. By the way, adultery does not operate just in its own vacuum. Yeah, there is what precedes adultery, and that is lust. When you look at a woman lustfully or at a man lustfully, you've committed adultery with that man or with that woman in your respective heart. Mm -hmm. That is now justice. Mm -hmm. That we are not just looking at the act itself. We want also to look at what is the heart posture. And you that is out to say that you demand justice, where do you stand? Mm -hmm. You are demanding justice on on which scale? Is it the scale of your own justice that you're calling the justice of God? Or are you speaking on the scale of the word of God, which is basically the redemptive work of Christ? Mm. And that is why we must never take revenge. Even when our enemies are going through stuff, Mm. we are commanded to pray for them. Even when your betrayer comes back and you can see that this person needs help, beloved, The righteousness of God requires and demands that we help such people. Now, helping somebody doesn't mean that you become ignorant and allow the same person to take advantage of you. That would also be your mistake. Mm -hmm. You see, you know, I was in a state whereby I had to learn this lesson twice. I was betrayed by somebody. Then later on, I received this person. And, you know, for me, I was just excited. You know what? I'm not looking at the past only to realize that this person had not completely changed. So the past, an opportunity was presented and the person now did even worse than initially. <laughs> I was completely hurt and I felt like I was very violated. Mm. But the same, same spirit of God that spoke to me in the past told me that I was actually at wrong. What I should have allowed was to be guided by the spirit of God as to how the relationship should be redefined. Mm -hmm. Why? Because some of the people that betray us, they do so because there are certain things about ourselves, about our personal lives that they do not have capacity to handle. Uh. So in order not to stumble them, it would be expedient that we conceal certain things about ourselves from such kind of people. And also even when we speak to them, we speak to them with a lot of wisdom. So that the enemy does not use them to destroy us. And that's why it's important for us to walk in discernment. Now, this is not to mean that you operate in a state of suspicion. Mm -hmm. Suspicion is not the issue here. What we are talking about is that we become men and women of prudence. Mm -hmm. Men and women of fortitude. Whereby we know how to handle people. We accept them just as Christ has accepted them. And we look at them the same way Jesus Christ looks at them. That even if somebody is a betrayer, we look at that as that angle of betrayal the same way God would look at this person, but at the same time figure out with the lens of Christ, how can this person become better? Otherwise, ladies and gentlemen, I think that is all with me. I think I, I, at this juncture, I hand over now to, to Lady Mandela, the chair of One Desire. Yes, um... I was about to say drops mic and literally <laughs> drop it, but uh, wow, what an exposition of that story. I think I've never seen that story in that light. And uh, I hope things are changing for people, both for the uh, victim and the offender. Uh, there's a redemption for everyone, even as we've seen in this uh, in today's session. Uh, God bless you and see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.